But so I, I want to get us an idea of, well, what is kindness? You know, sometimes we look up in the dictionary uh, the meaning of words, and sometimes we'll see kindness, the act or state of being kind. <laughs> and it's like when you use a different form of the word to explain the word, it, it's not helpful. It's like, hmm, happiness, the state of being happy. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I know what it means now. <laughs> so kindness is one of those words that you can't just say being kind. It's, let's talk a little bit more about what it means to be kind. How do you show kindness? Well, one way we could say it is it's the quality of being generous, helpful, and caring. So in kindness, there's the idea that you're a generous person, you're being generous, you're also being helpful, and you're also showing that you care. Another way to say it is the act of being caring or warm in spirit. So another facet of kindness is about your demeanor, being warm in spirit. Lastly, the quality of being warm-hearted and on top of that, considerate, humane, and sympathetic. So being considerate of others, humane means just being a civil type of person, somebody who sh who's a decent person, who shows decency, in, then sympathetic. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. But I think in our culture, uh, the idea of kindness is really downplayed because our, our society looks at other virtues or other attributes of a person as being these are the things that everybody should want to strive after. So what I have here is I have a little comparison chart of what our society thinks are the two big ones. Well, first you have brains, and then you have brawn. So one is the, how smart are you? You know, what do you, what do you have up top shelf here in your, in your mind? The other one is, how strong are you? Let me see those muscles. You know, I, so it's either you're tough or you're smart. And our society looks at these two things. I don't know about you, but that's kind of like, that was my experience growing up in high school. You have the two sides. You have like the athletes over here. Uh, they used to be called jocks, but the, the athletes. And then the other side, you have the nerds. The people who are just, are, are very smart, and um, so these, these two different categories are kind of at odds with each other, and they're like, these are the big things you should be wanting. You should be either t the tough guy, you should be macho, you should be strong, be able to run fast, leap over walls, and throw a football 100 yards. Or you're smart, meaning like you can do all the math problems, no problem, you can do your taxes when you're 11 years old, you know, and just like really impress people. But in... These qualities, though, they, they are only temporary because our muscles, our bodies, are in a constant state of decay. And so is our mind. If you uh, have lived for more than like 10 or 20 years, you'll realize that as you get older and older, everything doesn't work as good as it did when you were younger. And this is kind of what the prophet Isaiah was saying in chapter 40. In verse, 30, where, in verse 30, where it says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Even young people, no matter how strong they are, it's not strong enough. At some point, strength fails. And now if you think about, okay, well, what if I, what if I really work on building up my mind? What if I, I gain a bunch of knowledge and I'm, I'm super smart? I'm like a walking encyclopedia. Well, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, that knowledge puffs up. It's love that edifies or builds up. So knowledge, the more knowledge you accumulate, that only just makes you have a bigger ego. It makes you think that you know everything, that you're in control of everything, that you can expect everything. But it ends up that when you get later on in life that you lose some of that mental acuity. Your mental acumen goes down. Now, this is just for guys right now we're talking about, but the same thing happens for women. There's also a battle in our society for what is the most desirable attributes for a woman. So, let's put the chart back up. What are we, what are we going to pin against each other? First, we have beauty, being pretty. And then you have charm, being, being charming. So in, in our society, women are, look, are looking to the, these um, media sources, movies, TV, 
uh, music, and other things to see that all the women on these uh, shows are all beautiful or charming. And that is what our, our culture tries to promote as these ideals. I mean, ha have you guys ever seen somebody on The Bachelor that was a normal woman? I mean, geez, it's so unrealistic. But that's what our culture does. They try to put forward these, these, this idealistic picture of what people should look like or how they should be. But that's not right. Because Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs tells us that charm is deceptive. And beauty is but a vapor. Meaning it's there and then it's gone. But a woman who fears Yahweh, she will be praised. See, being beautiful and being charming... When you're young, you might have those things, but they fade. They're, they go just like strength and brains. These are all uh, ephemeral or temporal things that, that maybe you have at a moment, but they don't last. What does last, though? What can we say is a lasting quality? It's the quality of the heart. What about if your heart is full of compassion? Can you be 20 years old and have compassion in your heart? And can you be 80 years old and have compassion in your heart? Sympathy or empathy. Now, well, first of all, what's, what's the difference between those two? They're, they're very closely related words. One is the ability to actually, like, uh, sort of understand the emotions. It's from the Greek word to, have a, to be with passion. So to understand the emotions of another person, what they're going through, and be able to uh, be there alongside them and support them through it. Now, empathy is actually being able to put yourself in that situation that they're going through because you have experienced it before, and so you understand. You understand the emotions. You understand what they're going through, and therefore you can empathize with them because you've been there. Generosity being helping, and being warm and friendly. These are aspects of the heart that don't, don't fade with time. They only fade if we neglect them and allow ourselves to be swayed by the world, by the ways of the world, and, be, and for our heart to become distant from our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father God. Also, to be considerate to be mindful of others. Paul writes in Philippians that we're to esteem others or think of others more highly than ourselves. We're to look out for the good of others. That's a quality of the heart. I'd like for you guys to turn to Proverbs chapter 23, please. There's another piece of wisdom in Proverbs that will speak to us here in this topic where we're talking about the heart and particularly with kindness in our heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, keep or guard your heart with all vigilance or diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. The heart represents our will and our desires. It's the seat of our understanding, like the center of our mind. It's sort of where everything that we say and do comes from. I mean, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The idea to guard the heart means to be watchful over it, to like keep an eye on it, be attentive to your heart. Now, the last phrase, the issues of the heart. What is, the, what is the, this proverb speaking of about the issues? What are the issues in your heart? Everybody here got issues? <laughs> well, it's not that kind of issue, even though we all do, as imperfect people, have issues in our heart. This is referring to the idea of uh, the outgoings of life. The way that life goes is a factor of the heart, because the heart is the source of everyone's thoughts and doings. Everything in their uh, life proceeds from the heart. And if one does not guard their heart, meaning being careful to watch where their life is going, then their words, thoughts, and deeds will go astray to something else. Whatever you put in your heart, whatever you have in your heart, that is sort of like where you, that's your, your battery from which you draw the energy to be able to do things. And whether you think about it or not, 
Your heart is what drives you in life. And so uh, my contention today is that kindness is a matter of the heart. And if we're not careful to take care of our heart, then we can be sure that we're going to have trouble with kindness and being kind. Now I want to go through a couple qualities uh, of kindness here. What does kindness look like? Let's look in, in, what in practice, if we say, show me what kindness is, Jerry. Tell me what, what it's like, to, to, you know, to, what kind of a situation would it be where somebody is being kind? Let's start with being friendly. Being friendly. Let others know that they are worth the time for you to spend with them. That's being kind. I mean, how, how many times would you say somebody who wants to spend time with you, you'd say, that person's unkind. They're hanging out with me all the time. It's like, <laughs> no, it, it's, you know, you, you don't have to be every single person's friend. I mean, we're, we're to be friendly in general. But we also should make an effort that in our lives, we should go out of our way to spend time with people to, know, to let them know that they're special. They are worth time in our life to spend with. That is a way we can show kindness. It, it reminds me of a song from a, a movie I saw when I was younger called Toy Story. And there's a theme song in Toy Story that goes, you got a friend in me. You know that song? Yeah. Well, being a kind person, showing kindness, how about we can, we can be friendly, there, that people can know that you got a friend in me if you need one. That's being there for others. That is esteeming or thinking more highly of others because you want them to know that they're okay. You're all right. It's okay. I'll, I'll hang out with you. You know, spending time with you is fun. Being compassionate, or sorry, being kind it is also about helping solve problems. Being a helpful person is an act of kindness. Now here, it's just people, sh you know, we, we all have technology problems at times in our lives, right? <laughs> yeah, that's just technology. Well, one thing I like to, I like to, I enjoy solving technology issues. Ask my wife. Every time she has a problem with the computer, I'm like, oh, honey, show, show it to me. What's wrong? What's wrong? I'll fix it, you know? Uh, I like computers. I grew up with computers. I understand computers. And so one of the things about being kind and showing kindness is that we take the things that we're good at, like maybe it's, it's sewing and, and, and knitting and things like that, and we share those with other people. Or maybe it's working on, on cars. I tell you what, my friend Jim Allen back here spent all day on a couple Saturdays ago helping me with my brakes on my car. Man, I thought that was the kindest freaking, uh, <clears throat> kindest thing that he, he could have done for me, you know? Or I uh, also was uh, in, a, in a pinch one time trying to figure out some financial issues. And my friend Bill Yaconis back there was willing to take time with my wife and I to sit down and explain things because he understands finances. He showed kindness to us by giving us the time of his day to help us with what he was good at. So being helpful is a way we can show kindness to one another. Not only that, another thing is just being willing to listen. This, is, this can be difficult in life, can it? Being willing to just be patient, which is another fruit of the Spirit, and listen to somebody. Just listen to what they have to say with no agenda. No, like, get to the point, please. <laughs> you know, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything that a person could say uh, is better than when somebody, when you know somebody else has heard you, and you know that they have heard you, they have validated what you said. That is powerful. So just being willing to listen to somebody is showing them kindness. When times are, are tough, what about comforting one another? Consoling one another? Life is rough. Anybody gone through some rough times in life? And you need a friend? And you want that friend to be, to be a comfort to you, to support you, to be there and stand with you through the tough times. You know, you don't have to really even know what's going on. You don't have to be Mr. Fix-It or anything like that. What can be helpful is just knowing that you're not alone in the suffering. Kindness is just being with each other when we need somebody. 
You know, I was going through a really tough time in my life a few years ago. Um, everything was falling apart, and I didn't know what the next month was going to look like uh, with living circumstances, with employment. Uh, it, it was just, it was a very chaotic time of uncertainty. And man, un there's nothing like uncertainty to make you, to make you feel uh, uncomfortable uh, and uneasy and stressed. Yeah, but uh, a good friend of mine, um, Hugh and Susie Knowlton, invited me to come spend some time with them up at Silver Bay. And I tell you what, that, that was one of the kindest things that I will never forget, that they invited me to come spend some time with them and their family when I was, when I was on, on the rocks. I, I was at a really uh, disturbed and, and had a lot of stress in my life with the uncertainty, and, and it was really kind of getting me down. And, and I, I could use a friend. You know, and gosh, that was, that was such an amazing time. So I don't, you know, people, when they, when they uh, receive kindness, they tend to remember that type of stuff. You want to make an impression on somebody? Show some kindness. And if you do it in a very significant way, I tell you what, I bet you they will not forget it. You know, the things that when people get you out of a tight spot in life, you know, later down the road, those are things that you remember. You can also... Uh, I don't think a tablet works right now, Brad. Um, we're frozen. I'm, I'm going to go on. If you can come up here and uh, try and solve it for me. But another one we can do <clears throat> is we can be a nice person that is warm and safe. I have a picture, which maybe I'll show it if, if it works, but it's of a, of a guy with his family, just, just being with his family, and, and they, he just has a very nice smile on his face. It, it, it's a warm and inviting presence. You know, we looked at the definitions of uh, kindness, and one of them was being warm in spirit or being warm-hearted. If you have a, a, a facial expression or if you show yourself by your disposition and your body posture, even nonverbal communication, if you show yourself to be a safe and warm person, that's kindness. You're saying, I I'm, I'm okay, you can come talk to me, you can approach me. You know, if you see somebody who has a, a real hard edge or, or, man, they just walk around with a frown all the time, it, it, those people typically aren't very approachable. Because immediately, that type of a, of a demeanor sets up walls, sets up defenses. You, know, you don't want to go talk to somebody and, and ask for a favor if the person looks like a grouch. And lastly, <clears throat> kindness looks like picking people up or supporting people. And so there's nothing like it when there's people are there for you when, you when you need it so that people are reliable and trustworthy. And kindness actually requires a sacrifice. It requires you being able to reach out your hand and to be able to do something for somebody else. It's kind of like helping, but sometimes it's just picking people back up and encouraging them and helping them get back on their way. You know, I think about, I have friends who are exceedingly good at this. My friends Rose and Timmy Paul are super service-minded. They are great at helping people and supporting people and picking people up when they're down. You know, they're an inspiration. You know, when you look at other people who are being kind, it tends to make you understand, oh, that, is, that was a good thing to do for them. You know, I now think about the ways that I can be kind to others like that. You know, it, it's sort of, it's like a contagious thing to be kind to one another. And, you know, guys, uh, John, um, Pastor John here, he was talking about the benevolence team. Kindness is the name of the game with the benevolence team, everyone. And we have these cards. He spoke about them. But if you guys want to know the opportunities in our community for showing kindness, they're just on the back here. It says, receive benevolence emails when there are needs in the church. You can't show kindness if you don't know any needs that could be met. So please, if you guys want to know what people need, and if you could use your gifts and your skills and knowledge and resources to help others, to be kind to others, fill it out and put it um, in the back of the room when you leave. You know, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And that's what kindness does, is that 
when other people see how you show kindness to others, that's good. Maybe you can start that there for me. Um, uh, slideshow, current slide. Um, yeah, if you could put it up on that slide right there for me, thanks. Uh, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. When you see other people demonstrating kindness, it kind of uh, can provoke you to also remember, yeah, that's right, you know, being kind is, is what the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated in his ministry. It's what we're all to endeavor to do. So that's what kindness is contagious. You see somebody being kind, you're like, yeah, yeah, look at that. That's amazing. I want to do that too. Our Lord did that. But the one thing about, the easiest thing about being kind, <clears throat> this is something that takes almost no effort. And what it is, is it's smiling. You know, you can, you can show kindness, not actually by actually doing an act, not by helping people, not by sitting through tough times with them. You can show kindness by smiling. Can everybody smile? Show me a smile. Let me see some teeth. Smile. Yes. So easy. There was a study done. I want to talk about smiling here for a second. There was a study done in Sweden that showed that when people saw other people smiling, they automatically smiled back. And if they were told to frown, they actually started to smile, but then had to consciously work to bend their mouth downward. Like, there's a part in our brain that God designed. It's called the cingulate cortex. It deals with our subconscious automated responses. And when we see somebody smiling, we just naturally tend to smile back. And there's also a study that's done that when you smile, it's actually good for you, and it helps you, uh, helps release endorphins in your mind so you feel better. It helps lower your heart rate and blood pressure. And, and so that's what happens to you. Now, when you smile and somebody else smiles, not gonna... <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, uh, maybe I can just do it this Is this, wait, right here. We're, we're going to press on. <laughs> so we're talking about smiling. Um, in a study from the University of Tennessee this past year, they talked about that smiling actually affects your mood, affects your physiology, and affects your thought patterns in life. And if you smile, and you tend to produce a smile on somebody else, they found that if they put a metal, uh, not metal, a, a wooden frame in your mouth to cause you to smile forcibly, not even like, not willingly, not voluntarily, you got forcibly to smile, it actually caused people to have lower heart rate, lower blood pressure, and reduced stress levels. So you don't even have to want to smile. If you force yourself to smile, you'll feel better. And if you smile, other people will smile, and the world will be better. I mean, this is kindness. This is what kindness does. If you guys will turn with me to Titus chapter 3, please. All right, Titus chapter 3. In verse 4, <laughs> it says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The kindness of God. When the kindness of God appeared... Well, what is this kindness of God? What is it dealing with? Well, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead. We got nothing. We're D-E-A-D. -E we are dead. And when God sent the Savior, it says that he made us alive in him. The kindness was that when we were dead and we had nothing, God gave us something. God gave us life through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
In Romans chapter 2. In verse 4 it says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. The kindness of God in sending the Lord Jesus is meant for us to soften our heart, to realize that we've been shown kindness, kindness we didn't deserve, kindness that no one else would have shown us, only God. Only God cared and loved us. He loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. That whoever believes on him might have life, might receive that kindness of his. Kindness is first an act of God. And our kindness stems from the way that he has been kind to us. There's an illustration that I want to share with you guys. It's in Sam, uh, 2 Samuel. If you'll go to 2 Samuel... Chapter 9, please. In 2 Samuel 9, verse 1, it says, And David said, <clears throat> Is there still anyone left? of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Well, this is actually picking up in the middle of a big story, a big saga, where Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, had gone into the promised land of Canaan, and then they wanted a king. And so they asked God for a king, and God sent the prophet Samuel. He anointed a person named Saul. Saul became the first king of Israel. Well, God uh, told Saul at one time, he's like, go and uh, face the Amalekites in battle. Now, why? Well, because they opposed my people when they came up out of Egypt. I want you to go. And he's like, and I want you to utterly destroy them. And Saul's like, okay. So he goes, and he fights against them. And God said, utterly, dest utterly destroy everything. Everything. People, animals, property, at all. Well, Saul decides, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to keep the, the best of the animals and everything, and I'm going to let their king live, so I'm going to bring him back with me too. And God sends Saul, uh, Samuel to Saul and says, what have you done? Why did you disobey the Lord? He's like, oh, well, I, I wanted to, to bring all these animals here to sacrifice on the altar to God. God's like, uh, Sam's like, God don't care about sacrifices. No, God wants an obedient heart, and you have disobeyed him. You are no longer going to be king. And so God then takes Samuel and sends him to Jesse. And he finds Jesse's youngest son, David. And Samuel anoints him as the next king of Israel. But David's just a young lad. And Saul is still king in a political, uh, governmental sense. And uh, at one point, Saul, uh, the Spirit of God left Saul. And an evil spirit was tormenting him. And they sent for David because he played the harp to come and to soothe Saul. Uh, and, and so like David came and was served in Saul's court, and then Saul tried to kill him. And then eventually, David grows in, in rank and became a mighty warrior, and the people started recognizing him as being greater than Saul, and Saul grew in jealousy and tried to kill David, and he was on the run from Saul. Now David had married Saul's daughter, Michal, and Jonathan was Saul's son. And Jonathan and David were friends. And what Jonathan did is he tried to intercede with his father on behalf of David. And furthermore, when Saul tried to kill David, Jonathan went and actually helped David escape from being killed and murdered. And so what David is here, after Saul dies and David takes over and becomes king, David's like, is there anybody left from Saul's family? that I can show kindness to because of Jonathan. Because of my friend Jonathan, my brother-in-law, 
who helped me escape death more than once, more than twice, and who was concerned for me. And it even says that Jonathan loved David like he loved himself. Is there anybody I can show kindness to because of Jonathan? Verse 2, it says, Now there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He's in the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel uh, at Lodabar, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will, store, I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, which actually it's his grandfather, And you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? King David calls for this son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, who is crippled. He brings him to his palace. And he says, I want to show you kindness because I was shown kindness. I was shown kindness by your father, Jonathan. And a a crippled individual in the ancient world was basically looked at as being a worthless person. He even calls himself, I'm just a dead dog. Why would you even give two hoots about me? Why, Why would you call me here in the king's palace this, this, is, this is just unbelievable in their culture, in their society. But David said, I'm going to restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul. And I want you to eat at my table always. You have a permanent spot. You will always be accepted at my table. I'm willing to break bread with you. I'm willing to show you that you are not inferior to me. Wow. Wow. What kindness. He said, who can I show the kindness of God to? We just looked at the kindness of God in sending our Lord Jesus Christ. I think the greatest kindness that we can show others is to let them know that there's a Savior. We can show the kindness of God to others, not just through generous acts and helping You know, there are lots of of people in the world, there are lots of philanthropy organizations that do a lot of good. And that's great because that, that shows kindness. And kindness comes from God. But the ultimate kindness is helping one come to know the Lord. Because that is what will actually change somebody's life. It's it's not just it won't just give them a fish for a day to feed them. Man, you're teaching them to fish, you're teaching them to fish so that they can go to the source of all life. They can go to the source of all healing. They can go to the source of all comfort. We can comfort one another, you know, in, in, a, in a limited way as humans. But we can't do jo- God's job. God is the only one who can really heal a person's heart, who can really set the captive free, who can deliver people from evil and darkness, and can shine in their heart the truth of his word. There's a, something in our culture <clears throat> that I want to press against. Um, uh, I'd like to leave you with a, a definition here that I found that kind of reminds me of uh, the second Samuel, uh, David in 2 Samuel 9 here. It says, kindness is somebody who brings warmth and value to somebody with no expectation in return. When you bring warmth and value, whatever form it is, that's kindness you're showing somebody that they matter. And kindness is a language which the deaf can hear 
and the blind can see. Kindness transcends all the things our world thinks are great. Brains, brawn, beauty, charm. Kindness comes from the heart. And everybody can see your heart. There's a famous saying by William Arthur Ward. He's a famous American poet and writer. And this deals with smiling. I would encourage you guys to become masters of smiling. He says, a warm smile is the universal language of kindness. If you smile, you, sh you show somebody that you're a kind person. You're trustworthy. You're friendly. Willing to, willing to talk, willing to listen, willing to help. But in our culture, <clears throat> kindness is, isn't usually paraded around as a, a virtue to be desired. Actually, there's a, say, a slogan a lot of people might have heard that nice guys finish last. <laughs> Man, that's, that's really telling you that people uh, being kind, that, that's, that's something that everybody wants to desire. Nice guys finish last. Who wants to be last? No, everybody wants to win. You know? But see, nice guys finish last is the world's attitude. Actually, in the kingdom, nice guys are the ones who come in first. You know, the, the way that the gospel works is that what, our, what the world says, the gospel flips it upside down. The things the world thinks are important, the gospel says are not important. It's the wisdom of this world. It's foolishness. It's the wisdom of God that really matters, and the wisdom of God is simple. But the people who are wise in the world don't know it. Well, how is that? Because it's a wisdom that they don't pursue. So it's, nice guys don't finish last, every, folks. Being kind is treasure that you are storing up for yourself in heaven. We need to be people who practice kindness. Mother Teresa said, be a living expression of God's kindness. Amen. And that's what we need to endeavor to do. If we have the root of the fruit, then we will bear these qualities in our life. And kindness is something that we need to be known for as Christians. I'd like to invite the praise and worship team back up. God will help to show us others kindness in new and inspired ways as we walk by his spirit, as we allow him to lead and guide us. It is God who is at work in us, both to want to do and to be able to do those things that are pleasing to him. Father God, you help us in our time of need. Father, strengthen us to help others in their time of need. Help us to be individuals who show mercy, individuals who are generous, who are compassionate, who consider other people more important than ourselves. Help us to die to ourselves, God. Help us to be filled with your love, filled with your joy, and filled with your kindness. Help us to be patient with one another so that as we do, we can, we can be those examples of kindness like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was. Like we saw how, how David was with Saul's son Jonathan, that he wanted to show him kindness even after he had passed away, God. And he took his son and showed him kindness because of what he had received. Father, we pray that kindness is, it becomes contagious in your church, that people go from receiving kindness to showing kindness, and it has a ripple effect, and it just brings light and goodness into people's lives, Father. We thank you, God, that the kingdom is not like this world. Nice guys don't finish last, God. In your eyes, kindness is, is, a, is a prized possession, is a prized virtue and quality. Father, we pray that we cultivate that in our lives, and we never forget that it is you who ultimately is the kind, is the kind one. Lord God, we, we pray for this. We worship you in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.